welcome to UofL Today with Mark Hebert on Cards Radio 790 WKRD. This is the show that's about all the great things going on at the University of Louisville. So hopefully you'll learn a little bit here in the next half hour or so about some cool research happening at UofL. Exercising too much can be a sign of an eating disorder, and researchers at UofL are working on personalized health data and an app to help those with eating disorders. We'll hear from them a little bit later. But first, there's a lot of debate and talk these days about illegal immigrants on the U.S. border with Mexico, but the history of Mexico, the United States, the border, and the states that border Mexico can give us some insight into how we got into this tenuous situation we're in today. Catherine Masoff is an assistant professor of history who has studied all of this. Catherine, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank Thanks you for having me. Thanks for being me. on the show. Yeah, you, you got an interesting uh, background here uh, and, and all the stuff that you've looked at. So basically, the nuts and bolts of what you specialize in is looking at the Mexican-American uh, border, correct? Yeah, correct. All, all right. So give me give me some history. Give me the, the, okay. the broad overview. When you walk into that uh, History 101 class and you're mm. talking to the students on that first day, what do you tell them? Um, so one thing I really focus on in my class, especially since we're, we're in the Upper South, is uh, we really don't know the history of the U.S.-Mexico border. We don't. That's um, true. And so I try to really t- unpack the myths of the U.S.-Mexico border and really historicize um, the historical policing of the U.S.-Mexico border. Most people don't know that the U.S. Um, acquired the North American Southwest in 1848 uh, due to mm-hmm. a war. We went to mm-hmm. war with Mexico. Um, and that set up a system in which we have the American West, but the American border wasn't actively policed um, from 1848 until about 1924, and most people don't really know that history, and I, I like to break that down. Mm-hmm. Well, where was the border before 1848? Where was it? Uh, so it depends. Um, so before 1848, the U.S. Ma- the U.S. border um, really edged with the Spanish Empire and the Mexican Empire um, around what is today. So it'd be southern Oklahoma, um, northern Colorado, uh, all the way to what is Oregon, um, but really the states that are now California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah, and Nevada um, were once Mexico. That was once part of Mexico, and it was the Mexican northern frontier, and then prior to that, it was Spanish, and then prior to that, it was indigenous land. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people know that there is some Spanish history, some Mexican yeah. history in like California with Baja, that, those yeah. kind of things, but I don't know that most people know that the border with what was then Mexico went up that far north. Yeah, um, yeah. So. And most people, I mean, most people don't know this. The, the first European language spoken in North America is Spanish. Um, the oldest uh, European cities and um, government buildings in the United States are Spanish buildings, St. Augustine, Florida, um, the oldest government building in the United States. The longest inhabited government building is in Santa Fe, and that's because the Spanish were here um, long before the British arrived. Right. We're talking with Catherine Massoth, who's an assistant professor of history at the University of Louisville. So give us a little bit of history of who the first immigrants were. Who the, okay, so this is a, this is difficult. So the first immigrants were, I mean, really, it's been anybody. It's been Anglos since uh, the, the, the British came to I mean, the first immigrants from, from the, Mexico. The, the Mex- or, 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 yeah, from, coming so up, we from, actually coming up didn't, from the South, who were the, who were the first? That's the complicated thing. Is, I know. Uh, Mexican that's why I immigrants, that. Mexican immigrants prior to the 1924 were not really considered um, undesirable. Um, in fact, they were considered desirable immigrants. Did it's, we call them undocumented? We, we did not of call them undocumented be, because this is before um, the Passport right. Act and the Immigration Act of 1924. But really, it's um, in 1882 when the United States passes the Chinese Exclusion Act that we begin to label immigrants as undesirable or desirable. And so the first illegal or undocumented immigrants in to the United States are actually Chinese, and they enter through um, the Pacific Coast, Canada, and Mexico. And that's actually where we get the modern policing of the U.S.-Mexico border is um, the United States passed the Chinese Exclusion Act without actually considering um, how are we going, going to restrict immigration. And then as Chinese continue to enter the United States illegally, uh, the United States realizes we need to police our borders. And so they put that into place in when? The 1900s when? Um, it really depends on... Uh, it, the U.S.-Mexico border, it's really about after 1882, between 1882 and 1890, that they begin to increase the policing of the U.S.-Mexico border. But um, one statistic I like to give my students is between 1882 and 1890, there were only um, seven mounted police um, stretching between New Mexico and Arizona. So really, it, the modern enforcement that we think of today is really not till 1924, when we get the Immigration Act of 1924. And it really, I think what you're saying is came about because of the illegal Chinese 
Chinese immigrants coming in, not this huge flow from uh, So Mexico. originally, prior to 1924, it's, it's illegal Chinese um, and the fear of illegal Chinese entering into the United States from Canada and Mexico that really pushes the United States to define what is an illegal immigrant, who's illegal. Um, and then prior to 1924, during the war, we begin to... Um, have some an economic downturn and we begin to push out quote unquote undesirable laborers and that's Mexicans and that's when we begin policing them too. We're talking with Catherine Massoff as an assistant professor of history at the University of Louisville. So what as you're again talking to your students in class these days and we're you know we're going all this through all the stuff with uh, limiting the number of uh, immigrants mm-hmm. into this country these days we're building a wall mm-hmm. um, and they they you ask them to look back. What do they say? What do the students say when you tell them all this history about, well, we weren't policing the border and, until, you know, the 1920s. Um, you know, there really was nothing coming, nobody coming in from Mexico because Mexico was part of what is now the United States. What What do your students say about that? Um, I... I think one of the things that shock a lot of my students is that the, this rhetoric of um, the border has always been crossed and people have always been entering illegally. When they look at the actual statistics, that I think that shocks them to how new of a phenomenon it really is. It's really not until after 1924 that we have this phenomenon in U.S. legal terms of illegal immigration. Um, the other thing that I think shocks a lot of my students that I, I try to concentrate on is um, the way we acquired the North American Southwest was a process of colonization in which we undermined the values of the American Revolution. And my students read a lot of documents in which um, we kind of, we discuss some of the problematic language and the racist terminology that's used to justify conquering Mexicans and indigenous peoples. Um, And we kind of draw the parallels to the American Revolution. And my students are usually shocked to hear how we acquired the West. So we talked just before the break a little bit about the way that um, the United States of America got control of Mm -hmm. uh, Texas, uh, New Mexico, Arizona. What was the other one? I'm missing one. Nevada, Utah, California. All all those states. And you said basically what? How how did that come about? Um, We colonized. We entered the, the, I tell my students flat out, we entered the territory illegally. Um, Most uh, historians of the U.S.-Mexico border argue that um, it was an unjust war. and that we entered the regions with the intent of expressing manifest destiny and under the ideology that people of Mexican and Spanish descent and indigenous descent were backwards and we were there to um, improve the situation. So we went to war, we we illegally immigrated into Texas. Um, we broke the law, the Mexican laws of immigration. Um, and then we went to war, two years of war. Um, in that was which, in 1846, right? 1846 to 1848, the US-Mexico War. Um, and in fact, you know, presidents have, even said that this, it was an unjust war. Okay. And it, would you compare it to what happened with the American Indian? Af- would you, would you, like what, in what, general what with the yes, United States? Oh, um, yes. I mean, there's levels of colonization. Um, when the United States colonized the North American Southwest, they're colonizing both the Mexican people and the indigenous peoples. It's very, it's very similar. Um, one of the big differences is the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ends the U.S.-Mexico War, um, says that Me- people of Mexican descent will be grant if they live within the regions that we acquire, will be granted U.S. citizenship. Um, but one of the big differences is actually um, Article 11 of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo completely takes away indigenous citizenship. And in the Mexican government, indigenous peoples did have citizenship. Um, and so one thing I, I love to tell my students is um, we actually took away citizenship from indigenous peoples when we went west. Um, and so it, it's very similar, but there there are some differences because uh, Mexican people were kind of what um, the historian Katie Ben Cohen says are borderline Americans. They had citizenship, but they were treated as second class citizens, while indigenous peoples had no access to citizenship. Gotcha. All right. And when so after the United States and Mexico go to war for that two-year period in 1846 mm-hmm. to 48, we get some new states, right? We take over these territories and, and they're, they're, they're new states. So did they become states that Texas and Arizona and New Mexico become states then, or did, were they just a territory? So um, California and Texas, due to economic and political reasons, uh, because of the high amount of Anglo settlers who settled in California and Texas, partially California because of the gold rush in Texas because of ranching and the expansion of slavery, they became states in 1850. Um, Arizona and New Mexico became territories, and part of the reason they became territories 
Secretary's um, U.S. Congress said that they were too inhabited by undesirable peoples, which is people of Mexican descent and indigenous peoples. And that is because New Mexico and Arizona um, had the highest population of Mexican peoples prior to the U.S.-Mexico War, and Arizona had the highest population of indigenous peoples in the region. Um, and so they were held as territories for 65 years until they proved, according to Congress, that they were um, able to have the rights of citizenship. We're talking with Catherine Massoth, an assistant professor of history at the University of Louisville. So now we've got the border set at the Rio Grande. Yeah. Is, isn't that a logical place to set, set a border no. in Mexico? Why not? <laughs> well, one, I always tell my students, a uh, uh, river border is not a good border because rivers uh, change direction. Um, the Chia Mazal in um, El Paso is a really good example. There's a peri- there's a region in, um, in between Ciudad Juarez and El Paso in which, the, due to a flood, the river changed directions. And so there's a piece of land that um, is n- now has become a state park because the United States and Mexico have never agreed on who controls it. Um, so the river is not a good border because rivers change directions. Um, also, the in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, um, they didn't consider that the Rio Grande goes north. And so then we actually, a few years after the U.S.-Mexico War, we have to purchase southern Arizona. So Tucson and Nogales southward was actually part of the Gadsden Purchase. Um, so those regions came into the United States later. Okay. So, but we, but we got, we are where we are right, yeah. right now. Um, so the history of this is kind of a tortured history, yes. uh, that, that, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but we've got people that were uh, once living in, on American soil mm-hmm. are now either, either they become Americans uh, mm-hmm. because they're, from, they're living in Arizona or mm-hmm. Texas, the new states, or they're pushed back to Mexico, right? Yeah. So what happened when... Um, when that happened, did, 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 they, a, did, did they retreat? Uh, no, you know, that's a great question, and country? it's extremely complicated. In fact, it takes six weeks of my class to get well, to that got, point. We've got about thirty uh, seconds, so, so go ahead. So, what <laughs> happens is most Mexican citizens keep their Mexican keep their U.S. citizenship because um, Mexican identity was so attached to the land at this point, and these were families that had been on this land for generations. And one thing I tell my students is, it'd be like if someone came in from Missouri and told us, you know, you you, you are now part of Missouri. You have an option to move. To Indiana. You would never move to Indiana, right? You wouldn't want to leave your land, and so you would stay in the United States. So most Mexicans stayed in the United States. They just became second-class citizens. Mm. And what is the lesson for today? Um, the lesson for today is the history of the U.S.-Mexico border is extremely um, more complicated than just simply saying uh, people are crossing the border illegally and that they're coming here to work and steal our jobs. Mm-hmm. And do you think anybody will listen? Or are- um, I hope they listen. I, I, I think they will. I think we're, we're ra- raising a generation in which people are understanding the complexities of it. And if you look at the Chicano rights movement and the indigenous rights movements, we see it. Yeah, but but most folks, as you mentioned, most of your students are surprised by the by the history, and so I think, don't you? I mean, as a historian, obviously you want folks to know history, but most folks don't don't know. Most Americans don't know the history of the the tortured history, as I call it, between Mexico and America, right? Yeah, they, they don't know it, but that's why we go on radio shows, we we, <laughs> we write books, we uh, we make documentaries, etc. Um, I think we're trying to get out there, and I mean, it, also historians um, actively serve as expert witnesses at Congress and in the Supreme Court to get this information out there. All right, all right, very good, Catherine Mathoff, Massoth. It's good to have you on the show. I Thank appreciate you. it. I see, I learned a lot today. That's, that's what this show is all about. And I hope our, our listeners did as well. At least 10 million Americans are suffering from potentially life-threatening eating disorders. The University of Louisville is one of the places doing extensive research on this. Sherry Levinson is the director of the EAT Lab, Eating Anxiety Treatment Lab. And Lee Brosoff is a doctoral student working at the EAT Lab as well to find better ways to identify and help treat people with eating disorders. Welcome back to the show, ladies. Good to see you. Thank you. Nice Thanks. to see you. Glad you, to be here. Yeah, you've been on a few times. We've been talking about eating disorders for the last couple of years on the show occasionally. So I guess we ought to start with what is the EAT Lab? Sherry, what is it? Sure. Um, so the EAT Lab is located in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences, and we have um, our ultimate goal is to develop new treatments for eating disorders. Um, so we don't really have great treatments for eating disorders, and the treatments that we do have only work for about 50% of individuals with an eating disorder. Uh, so our mission is to develop new treatments and to be able to disseminate them um, in the community. And you're the director of the EAT Lab, Brosoff, you're a grad student, uh, a doctoral student. Yes. So what do you do at the EAT Lab? So I'm a fourth year doctoral student currently. So you're just about done. So almost done. <laughs> um, so my research focuses on 
uh, joint mechanisms between other disorders and eating disorders. So we do a lot with anxiety disorders and seeing how we can learn from other disorders to apply that to what we know about eating disorders. So we're using the broad term eating disorders for folks who are listening out there. What uh, Name some eating disorders. Tell me what they are. Bulimia, you know, kind of go through the list of what we're talking about here. Sure. Um, so the eating disorders that most people have heard of are anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. Um, there's also binge eating disorder. And actually 50% of people who have an eating disorder fall into this category called other specified feeding and eating disorders or OSFED. Wonderful <laughs> yeah, name there. Yeah, easy for you to say. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and that is just any kind of eating disorder that doesn't fall into one of the three primary categories. So anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating disorder. Something you can't put your finger on. Uh, it- kind of unspecified for lack of a better term right yeah yeah okay and and the eat lab is, is it mainly clinical or research or both Um, So we do clinical research primarily. So uh, most of our research is treatment development with clinical populations. So for example, my PhD students um, are treating patients as part of clinical trials. So people are able to get treatment, but we're doing research on that treatment. And we want to point out to everybody that's listening, uh, we always need folks to uh, be in clinical trials. So uh, always contact the University of Louisville if you're interested in being that and doing that, not just with you guys at the Mm -hmm. Lab, but all across the University of Louisville research operation. All right, that said, all right, Lee, let's let's talk about your study that you did on exercise and eating disorders. Go ahead and uh, why don't you describe what the uh, what the research was about? Absolutely. So um, over exercising is a big issue in eating disorders, um, but we don't really understand a lot about like what the function of that is. So there's a lot of different eating disorder behaviors out there. There's restriction that people know about. So like limiting how much food you eat. Um, people know about binge eating, overeating, but exercise is another prominent symptom in eating disorders. Um, and so this paper really looked at better exploring what is the function of exercise within an eating disorder. So there's kind of different camps about what people think is going on with exercise. So this was specifically looking at exercise dependence. So thinking about exercise almost like an addiction behavior. Um, So I got to get to the gym. I got to get to the gym. I got to get to the gym. Yes. Okay. And feeling like um, if I don't exercise, then, um, you know, my whole day is ruined exercising even when you're injured or sick, exercising for specific amounts of time, like hours and hours of the day. Um, And so really feeling this driven pull to continue to exercise despite negative consequences, not spending time with family and friends and would rather exercise. Right. She's Lee Brosoff. We also have Sherry Levinson, both from the Eating Anxiety Treatment Lab at the University of Louisville. Um, So what what'd you find? I mean, did you find that that people who are over-exercising, all of them are going to have eating disorders? <laughs> no. So actually, it's a very small um, portion of people who are over-exercising. And so what's interesting is that it seems like the function of exercise is different for people with eating disorders. So um, we only looked at people with eating disorders in this sample, so we can't definitively say it's different. Um, but it seems like it's playing a similar role to a lot of other eating disorder behaviors in that it's helping individuals with eating disorders avoid emotions. Um, It's giving them a sense of control over their life um, and it's taking up a lot of their time. Um, And so in that regard, um, it can be treated just like other symptoms in eating disorders can be treated. And I think uh, conventional wisdom, a lot of people um, initially when they get into treatment, their exercise just gets totally cut off. And so what this um, study says is maybe we want to taper it off and maybe we want to treat it more like we're treating these other symptoms mm-hmm. that we like, see. Like an addiction. So Sherry Levinson, do you see a lot of these folks? Lee said it's a small percentage, but is it a large percentage of people with eating disorders have yeah, yeah, we see okay. a lot of people, especially with anorexia nervosa and bulimia, who are doing a lot of overexercise. So, I, I mean, I think that the general public usually thinks about exercise like a good thing, right? So it's mm-hmm. a little bit different to think about it this way. Um, but, I mean, what we see are people who are spending hours and hours exercising, or they are significantly underweight, their heart rate is slowing down, they're about to end up in the hospital, and they're still running 10, 12 miles a day. Um, so really problematic behaviors and really in a compulsive fashion that they just they can't stop these behaviors even though they know that it's causing them to potentially die they are still engaging in those behaviors and so you said you treat it or treat it like an addiction so what does that mean how do you get someone that 
is over exercising and running the 13 miles a day and they weigh 85 pounds uh how do you get them to quit well so if they are not medically stable we just cut it all off right so you know if you have somebody whose heart rate is dropping below 40 they cannot exercise whatsoever but if you have somebody who's still pretty healthy but they're exercising 10 12 miles a day what we've started um, doing is we will gradually decrease the exercise because actually what we're starting to find is that if we just completely pull the exercise off that gives a huge increase in anxiety and depression so instead we want to start tapering exercise down in the same way we might work with behaviors like binge eating. So it's going to be really difficult for somebody to just stop overeating, but we work on decreasing that behavior over time. So Lee, if I have a relative or a friend that is going to the gym every day and they're running 10 miles, I've seen they've had a little bit of weight loss. Should I say something? Should I, what, what, what should I do? Um, I would say I would reach out to somebody that's close to them and see if someone can have a conversation with them and just check in with them and say like, hey, are are you okay? Like I noticed, you know, you've been acting differently lately Um, and really starting that conversation from a place of compassion and wanting to check in on that person. But I should have that conversation. Should I even say anything at all? So, uh, I mean, I would say, I I would say you should never comment on someone's weight, shape, or appearance, right? Um, So if you notice somebody has lost weight, that's great, right? But maybe instead of saying, hey, I've noticed you've lost weight, you look really good, you might want to say something like... But if I know they're working out, you know, uh, excessively, let me give you an Mm -hmm. example. There's a a young lady that goes to the same gym I do, and I Mm -hmm. thought about saying something. I don't know her, but she can't weigh more than like 85 or 90 pounds, and she's in there every single day that I'm in there, and she's running, you know, 10 miles a day, and she just... I mean, it looks to me like she's probably potentially Mm. got a problem. Should I say something? Well, I think it's really... If I knew her. Uh, I, I wouldn't if, say If you stranger. knew her. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I think you might say, I, I'm noticing some changes in your behavior. And you might then think about giving her some resources to people that she could reach out to. So the National Eating Disorder Association, NIDA, has a great um, section on their website that talks about how to reach out to fr- uh, friends and family members that seem to be struggling with an eating disorder. And it's got a whole lot of tips about how to talk to somebody that you suspect might have an eating disorder or might be engaging in overexercise, things like that. But it, it's a hard conversation. It's really hard to do. But on the, on the, the, other side of it is if this person, this theoretical person in the gym mm-hmm. that's over-exercising, right. if she keeps doing what she's doing, she, she's she got a very high likelihood of dying. Um, so you kind of have to weigh that. Do I want to try and prevent her death by mentioning something to her, or do I want to avoid it? Right. I got you. All right. We're talking again with uh, Sherry Levinson and Lee Brosoff, both from the Eating Anxiety Treatment Lab at the University of Louisville, and they're both uh, uh, working at UofL. Uh, Lee's a doctoral student. Sherry Levinson is the director of the Eat Lab. All right. Let's move on to topic number two here. Um, Sherry, I want to talk about personalized treatment and depression. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, let's talk about personalized treatment first. Um, You did some sort of study or you're working on working on some potential phone technology, right? Mm -hmm. To have more personalized medicine, personalized treatment for folks with eating disorders. Why don't you talk about that? Sure. Um, So currently we're running a personalized treatment study for eating disorders in our lab. Um, So when we're thinking about developing treatments for eating disorders, the types of treatments that we have right now are developed based on averages. So everybody gets the same treatment. So no matter what your symptom presentation looks like, you come in and you start with the same interventions one by one by one. But we know that people with eating disorders and people with depression, for example, look extremely different based on their individual differences. So what we're developing is a um, methodology that we combine a smartphone application with a new type of statistical analysis called network analysis. And what we're able to do is actually assess people for two weeks using their phone and then use that to build models that show us for that one person Um, these are the specific symptoms that are really maintaining their eating disorder. And that means that we then need to target those symptoms in treatment, right? So instead of starting with A, B, C, D, we take what we've learned from the smartphone application and we start treatment differently based on the individual. And we're currently testing that in the laboratory. 
Um, and then as an extension of that, well, really the first step for doing that is to, te to, be, to be able to build these individual models and to look at how individuals vary based on their symptoms. And so that's what we're doing right now with depression. Um, so we're supported by a Wright Foundation grant, and we're starting to build these individual models for people with depression so that we can then take the next step and start developing personalized treatments for depression. Well, that's kind of interesting because everybody has a smartphone. Mm -hmm. um, so the question then becomes, is it just like what I have on my smartphone, it tracks the number of steps I take per day and how many you know steps I go up and down, that kind of thing. Is that what we're talking about here? Or do the people have to actually input, here's how many calories I ate, uh, here's how many steps mm -hmm. I took, that kind of stuff? Yeah, so um, it, it's not, it's, it's not, it, they have to, they have to answer more information, but it's not as specific as like how many calories am I eating? So basically what happens is you get a notification on your phone and you answer about 30 questions several okay. times throughout the day. That's asking about your symptomatology, your mood, behaviors that you're engaging in. Um, it takes about three minutes to do five times a day. And the benefit of that is then you get to come in and have a personalized treatment that can really understand understand why am I suffering in the way that I'm suffering. Mm -hmm. And Lee, is the, is the big uh, benefactor here, obviously, is the person who has the eating disorder, but is it also broader that you can get a, uh, a broader picture of the various eating disorders? Because right now you're taking like averages, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So we know that eating disorders are extremely heterogeneous and they really look different person to person. And so what's amazing about these models is that the person, you see two people that come in and they have the exact same diagnosis. They have anorexia nervosa and you would think that they would look the same and they look completely different. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we have these treatments on averages, it tells us why those treatments aren't working as effectively as possible because people are so different even within the same diagnosis. So how soon before we get this modern technology <laughs> in the hands of folks with eating disorders and it might actually make a difference in their lives that, that we can show that this works and that you know it, it's going to wind up in everybody's pocket uh, you know, that has an eating disorder in the future. How long are we looking down the road here? Sure. Um, well, so we're developing the treatment right now. We've applied for funding from the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, so if anybody out there wants to support <laughs> eating disorder and depression yeah, research, we money. always we yeah, always we'll, we'll welcome donations. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I, I would guess between two to five years. Um, right now we're developing it and really our next, and we're testing the treatment and then our next step is to start working with engineers to really be able to put this into a format um, that can be easily disseminated. Another good thing at the University of Louisville, multidisciplinary things going on where you got the engineers working with the psychiatrists, psychologists, etc., cetera, on, on new devices that might help people. Okay, uh, last, last question. What is the bottom line message to folks out there who are listening who may have someone in their family that they think, yeah, they might have an eating disorder? What would you tell them? Um, I would say the, to reach out for professional help. So the resources are here now in Louisville. There are places that people can go to get help. Um, and don't wait. Do it now. The longer you wait, the harder um, recovery will be. All right. Sherry Levinson, Lee Brosoff, always good to see you, too. Thank you Appreciate so you much. being on the show. Thanks. All right. That'll about do it for this edition of UofL Today with Mark Hebert, which you can hear every Monday night at 7 and Sunday morning at 8 on Cards Radio 790 WKRD. You can also listen to the podcast of the shows on SoundCloud or watch the shows on KETKY or Louisville's Government Access Channel, Metro TV, throughout the week. Check out all the UofL news, videos, and events at UofLnews.com. Thanks for listening to UofL Today with Mark Hebert. And go Cards!